Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Thank you very much for watching. Hello, uh, Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, today's date, it's uh, September 6th of 2022. I'm not sure if this is going to be a different kind of a video or if it maybe, maybe it's really, you know, uh, something that I've talked about. Uh, I don't. I don't want to bring too much personal stuff into, you know, these YouTube videos. And I have a pretty good idea what, because also because of, I've mentioned this before, you know, the age of the people who are coming to my site. Males 18 to 45 or something like that. 99.9%, .9%, very few women. Uh, that doesn't matter, but uh, uh, so I'm sure most of you are interested in, you know, the uh, computer stuff and stuff like that. But I, I haven't wanted to bring in personal stuff too much. Well, one, my family, of course, and I'd have no problem with that. My family does not want to be in my videos. They, you know, they're not interested in it. They want their privacy and what have you. So, but those of you who have been following me for a while probably have, have are probably able to know what a little bit what's going on. Uh, um, probably, if you're watching it, you've picked up on the fact that, uh, well, when I'm very liberal. And the other thing, you, one of the other things you may have picked up on is that I'm very much interested in uh, help f and for people who are mentally ill. And I'm I'm guessing that you probably a lot of you have you know have picked up on that and probably know that there's a little something going on you know in my life that makes me that way. I'm going to talk now, uh, not going to be any secret from this point on. Well, I'm not going to talk about it all the time unless it helps. Uh, uh, I got married at age 26. My wife and I, um, had four, you know, four children. Um, uh, my wife, uh, we were married for 12 years. Um, my, um, I do want to mention this. I've mentioned this before. I don't know why I want to fit it in here, but anyway, my oldest daughter, very smart, and I, I know I guess a parent is not supposed to say that, uh, but she is very smart, very high IQ, and been is very has been very productive. Although she's retired now, um, she was the head of the uh, Greenpeace office in Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, uh, she had her crew, you know, they went out and surveyed and did stuff like that. They would go out to different areas of the city, you know, as a team. And they would hand out like a little newsletter telling, hey, there's the following things that are happening where you can help uh, with whatever their cause was. 
And then they would also, you know, let the people know you could make a donation to Greenpeace and whatever. Anyway, my daughter was out in, uh, well, her team was out, but she, they were, I think, I'm not, I'm not sure if she had the others doing it too on a, a residence or if it was, you know, anyway, she went, she went door to door. My daughter did, you know, herself. Uh, Overland Park, by the way, in Kansas, you know, it's a suburb. That's not, they would consider themselves a suburb of Kansas City, Missouri. Overland Park is the uh, upper uh, scale, uh, you know, uh, definitely Republican. Uh, anyway, she went to this uh, door and a nice lady, appeared to be a nice lady, came to the door and she said, you know, whatever her, you know, however, you know, that she was with Greenpeace and and the lady said, I'm not, I'm not interested, you know, and my daughter said, well, you know, thank you very much. And my daughter walked down, you know, off of the property and got back on the sidewalk and started heading to the place next door. And a car pulls into the, the place that she just left, pulls into the driveway. Guy gets out, goes up to the door, you know, husband, and he goes up to the door. And the wife is, his wife is still there. And uh, he asked her, who was that girl? And by the way, my, even today, my oldest daughter looks very young and she's, she's small. And uh, uh, so anyway, he asked her, who was the person at the door? And uh, his wife said, you know, well, a lady from Greenpeace. And then he went down immediately and contacted my, you know, hey, you. <laughs> and uh, uh, asked what she was doing at the door. And she said, well, you know, she had a badge on and every, you know, everything and pamphlets, you know said, I'm, you know, with a Greenpeace. And he said, well, I'm a, I, I don't know if he gave his rank or not, and I don't know what his rank was, except it was, he was a, you know, high-ranking police officer with the Overland Park police officer. I don't know if he was a major or a colonel or whatever, but apparently he was a high, you know. And he said, well, what you did is against the law, and uh, I'm, uh, you're under arrest for going to the door. It's against the law to solicit and uh, uh, I'm tired of you hippies. And I think they, I think they might have been for the. And I think he told her that, yeah, you know, in person, you know, tired of you hip hippies and uh, you know left wingers, you know, and your philosophy and your politics or whatever. So he called for a, you know officer on patrol or whatever for that area and the officer you know came over and uh he said uh you know i want her arrested for you know going door to door soliciting or whatever and the officer according to my daughter said the officer says you really want to arrest this you know he says yeah put the handcuffs on her put her in a car and take her and book her on i forget what the you know what the charges were and so the, uh, anyway, another officer pulled up, you know, and, and I, I guess that maybe the guy went back into his, you know, house or whatever. Uh, but the uh, officer said to the other officer, you know, Colonel, whatever the rank was, you know, wants this, you know, and the other officer goes, what, you know, what? Looks like I'm off subject, doesn't it, by the way? Because this is off subject. I don't know why I tied in with this. Well, I do have actually a reason, but I'm going to leave that reason out. Um, so anyway, the other officer is, you know, I forget exactly what the, it's because it's been a lot of years ago, a lot. Says, uh, you know, um, going to arrest her, arrest her, you know. Yeah, and yeah, he wants her, you know, booked and uh, whatever. And okay, you know, okay, so, uh, so she's taken to the Oldham Park Police Department. Now, I was a, uh, at that point, hospital security officer. I was actually a hospital security officer for 30 years. And, uh, 
but I was also for 10 years and a reserve officer for the Raymore Police Department, a very small police department. So they, they, in the beginning for years, they couldn't afford. They had one full-time officer for years. And so there were seven reserve officers and we each patrolled one night a week. And it was totally up to us, you know, when we came in or if, if we came in. And I, I did it for 10 years and never missed a night. You know, my, my, the night of patrol was Sunday night because when I uh, became a reserve officer with him, that was the night that was available. But uh, it just so happens that uh, I, now occasionally the Raymore Police Department, I have to have something. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I know it's probably rude. Uh, I'd been asked by the Raymore PD, which they happened occasionally, to uh, patrol for the day, do the day shift uh, for them. So I patrolled the day shift, and uh, I just came in from Raymore PD, and the telephone rang, and uh, it was uh, my daughter, Ladonna. And she said that she'd been arrested by the Overland Park Police Department and, you know, for going door to door or whatever. And uh, uh, I said, I'll, I'll be right, you know, I'll come. So I got out of the uniform, of course, and everything. And locked up my gun and everything. And uh, then drove out to the Overland Park Police Department. Well, when I got there, she wasn't there, which even I knew that was unusual. She was arrested by the Overland Park Police Department. When I got there, they said, no, she's in the, uh, you know, the county jail. And I thought, you know, who, who would arrest somebody, one, for going door to door for Greenpeace or any, anything, you know. And, of course, I didn't know about the comments that he had made, you know. That, uh, but So, anyway, I went out. To, had to drive out to Olathe, Kansas. Got there and, uh, you know, uh, paid for her bail or whatever it was. And so then, so then she told me in the car, you know, that when the, uh, what, what the, you know, the, what I've told you so far. But that, then she told me, you know, that when she got out to the Overland Park Police Department, and I, I, you just got to, you know, picture. If there's somebody in the world who is, looks non-threatening, non-troublesome, I mean, you know, that's, you know, that's LaDonna. Uh, she, you know, she probably probably looked like a 14-year-old girl or something at that point, you know. Maybe 16, I doubt that. Uh, but she was running the Greenpeace office but uh, in Kansas City, Missouri. Later on, she uh, uh, went to, uh, on the East Coast someplace, a big city you've heard of, I forget what. She was in charge of the Greenpeace office there. And then later, they asked her to go out to Los Angeles and be in charge of the Greenpeace office there. Uh, anyway. I knew, by the way, I knew my daughter was, you know, I knew she was smart. I think dumb people can tell smarter people, you know, maybe, well, maybe it depends on your level of dumbness, you know. Maybe some people are at a level where, you know, they're so dumb that they can't, but I, I knew she was smart. Uh, on local television, she was in Kansas City, Missouri, she was interviewed uh, by the local public television station or whatever. And... I uh, watched watched that uh, her interview, and I've never, you know, that was a long time ago. I've never seen anybody so articulate and have all of the facts and all of the information on the subject. You know, it was like wow. I thought, 
I thought, maybe she's not my daughter, you know. Um, anyway, LaDonna told me that, you know, when she was taken to, what happened, you know, and when she was taken to the police department and, and taken in there and in handcuffs, by the way. I wonder if the handcuffs might not, might have fallen off or whatever. Um, she said police officers were coming in, you know. Who's, what's, who's the girl here? What's, you know, and then she could, you know, she could tell, you know, the officer, you know, what the officer was at. Uh, major, whatever, you know. Uh, she went to his house and he wanted her arrested. And, he, and like, they were like, what? Arrested? You know? And yeah, you know, let's say colonel. I'll give, I'll, I'll give him the rank of a colonel. So, well, you know, colonel, so-and-so, you know, he wanted her arrested and everything, you know. And then I think some of them, you know, some of the officers came by. You know, why is she, in, why is that girl in handcuffs, you know? So, anyway, um, uh, I, of course, knew, oh, let's see, what is it called? Oh, God, I never can remember it. If you're driving through the United States into some states, uh, you'll see signs that'll say such and such a law enforced. And that's a law that... Uh, a local town or a county, maybe, or whatever, can, I have to eat, I'm, I'm going, I'm, you know. Can, what in the hell is it called? Anyway, I can't remember. But it was passed a long time ago in various states and counties and uh, things saying that you can't go, you know, you can't go door to door trying to sell anything or something like that. It's been ruled unconstitutional multiple times. I think a lot of the signs you see uh, sticking up, or, you know, just signs that they didn't take down. But some places that law is still still in effect. But it does not prevent somebody going to your door for political reasons. It's unconstitutional to do that. The I mean they're not gonna do something to the you know, the homeowner who you know uh but to the city or the state or the county, you know, the Supreme Court can and ha has ruled against them, and it's it's unconstitutional, you know. And also, you can't prevent, what did I say? Okay, political reasons. If somebody comes to the door for the Democrats or the Republicans or what, or Greenpeace or something, you know, the homeowner can say, I'm not interested, and, you know, you you should say, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bother you, or and you know, leave. Uh, it's the same with religion, because of our, you know, because of our constitution. <clears throat> it's the same with uh, religion. If a, if the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, or what's a, some others that that a lot of people dislike, you know, could be well, this could be religion, you know, but. If they, if they come to the door, <clears throat> they can't be arrested for violation of the, whatever it is. Uh, oh, hang on here a second. No, it doesn't matter what the name of it is. Uh, they, you know, the same with the, con with the religion or whatever. So anyway, she was illegally, you know, arrested. And plus to his personal feelings shouldn't have entered in, you know, shouldn't have entered into it. And the guy was an asshole, I'm sure. Uh, anyway, I told, uh, LaDonna already knew, of course, about that. That's something that she would have to know, is being, doing that kind of stuff, you know. Anyway, I, uh, she had a court date. And, uh, I said, uh, 
well, you know, let's contact the American Civil Liberties Union. I'm sure that they have handled this case before, and I'm sure they'll want to handle it now, you know. And she said, great. So, um, I called up the ACLU. Now, there is a whole bunch of you, if you're in the United States, there's a whole bunch of you who are right-wing and uh, you're not Democrats, you're not liberal. And you fucking hate the American Civil Liberties Union. It's been made into uh, a left-wing, uh, insane Kabul of, uh, I don't know, terrorist or whatever. I mean, it's fucking crazy. Uh, remind me, there's a little, oh, I had to, this is, okay, this is not going to be on, this video is going to be, I guess, on this, because I'm already committed to this. And then a little bit later here, I'll hopefully make the video I want to make about mental illness and, and, you know, informing you that I have a son who is 50 something. And at 20 years of age, uh, schizophrenia hit him. And we have gone through and we're still going through it. And right now, uh, we don't know where he is. The other, for like the last uh, two weeks, of course, he, he refuses to take his medication. For the uh, last two weeks, it's been almost nonstop hysterical laughing, kind of scary, like, and loud, in addition to you know, the other stuff that's, that's going on. Uh, so I'll, I'll come back. That's going to be the next, the next video about my son. And we don't know where he is right now. Well, let me put this in at this point. This will be like a teaser. Uh, not... Oh, see, I, we lose, you know, we lose time. One, because we're not, you know, getting sleep and because so much is going on and you worry so much. And, and uh, anyway, the, oh, I think it was last night, about 10 p.m., he'd been laughing all day and he was talking, you know, and I couldn't understand what he was saying. He was also... It was like somebody was right. He was he was talking to somebody, you know, that was that he saw or whatever. He was talking to them, and about ten o'clock at night, he well then, you know, then he started. Then it sort of changed, and uh, my ex-wife and I. Uh, thought that maybe he was having, you know, breathing difficulties or chest pain or something like that. And of course, you know, uh, Jimmy, are you okay? Are you okay? Or whatever. And of course, it, then it was like he was talking to somebody who wasn't there. But he was also, and then he started walking back and forth, walking back and forth, walking back and forth. And it seemed like he couldn't breathe or maybe he was having chest pain, but he wouldn't answer. So then he just went and walked out the front door and I went and put my pants on and uh, came back, went out to, I waited a little bit, went out to check on him to see if he was okay, gone. So then I started walking through the apartment as best I could. I walked through this apartment complex looking, I went out on the street and looked up and down the street and with the physical with my legs and my feet and stuff like that. I almost fell like maybe 12 times out there because anyway, because of my leg and feet problem. Uh, anyway, he was gone. <clears throat> so about 2 a.m. in the morning, <clears throat> we I called the non-emergency phone number for the uh, Fort Worth Police Department and inform them of, you know, the situation and uh, 
the uh, dispatcher. You know, they have a police have him in their computer. He's never hurt anybody. Uh, but he's done some, you know, screaming and hollering and stuff like that. And uh, so, you know, we I, we called the, uh, actually when we called, asked, I asked for the non-emergency dispatcher because I couldn't find the non-emergency number. And uh, then I realized later that I was looking at the Dallas Police Department non-emergency number. When this, when all this is going on, you're worried so much. <clears throat> you're not, you know, not functioning as, you know, as well as you probably should or as I should. Anyway, call the uh, police and uh, explain to the. Uh, well, anyway, when I called the Fort Worth, uh, and I asked for the non because I couldn't, you know, she said, "Well, right now I'm asking, uh, and I'm doing both." So I, and she was very, very nice. They've always been very nice on the phone. And uh, I explained everything, and uh, I said, we were wondering if you could put out to locally, because the local, the officers in this, you know, this district, the West Division or whatever it is, I don't think I said that trip, but the officers in this thing, they've dealt with him before, and he has a habit of, you know, going over to a local 7-Eleven or something like that, and uh, police have been called there before. Uh, not because of any violence or anything on his part, but just because he looks weird and strange and maybe acts, you know. And so she said, well, I'll put it out to the local, you know, and I said, I appreciate that very much. Uh, you know, we didn't hear back anything. And then my ex-wife, uh, about... Uh, She called, uh, uh, I'm going to say UPS, that's not it. Uh, what is it? I should know. Anyway, called the uh, Western, not Western Missouri, Mental Health, that's from Kansas City, Missouri. That he was there many times. Oh, I want to, I want to get off this subject and go back to the, uh, I'll be repeating this part in the next part. Okay. Anyway, I, uh, after LaDonna was arrested, I called the uh, uh, ACLU and uh, I explained it and they said, oh yeah, this has been decided by the, the Supreme Court of the United States and uh, we will definitely take the case. And I said, okay, thank you, all that kind of stuff. And uh, then told LaDonna, and then LaDonna called, you know, the Greenpeace office, and they said, no, 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 we don't want anything to do with uh, a court case, and we'll send a lawyer, you know, our lawyer will go with you to court when you go, and uh, you will plead guilty, and, uh, you know, we'll pay, you know, we'll pay whatever the fine is. So when LaDonna got back to me, I was I was pissed. And that was it for the, you know, Greenpeace. I've been a supporter of Greenpeace, you know, because my daughter was heading up, you know, her office and stuff like that. Well, I mean, also politically, I was, you know, and, uh, but that was it. To hell with them. Uh, not long after that, Greenpeace stopped having local offices because, you know, I, I, I'm sure they, weren't taking in that much in donations where they could just put ads in Time Magazine and various places, you know, where people could click on it and go there and save the whales or whatever. So, um, I'm still pissed about that police officer out there in Overland. Now, I had dealt with Overland Park police officers before. Uh, because I worked hospital security all together 30 years at different hospitals. I also worked for many, many years a second job of contract security. I worked for 
at least one year for Pinkerton. I think I worked a couple of times, you know, a couple other times. But one entire year I worked for Pinkerton. Saved all that money, which was just barely above the minimum wage. Um, and my... My wife at that time, and LaDonna and uh, Hillary, our first two, uh, we, we drove down to Mexico and crossed over to Mexico and drove to Chihuahua, uh, Durango, up where they make a, made a lot of movies, you know, Western movies, and then down to Mazatlan. By the way, I think I'm mispronouncing all of those, <laughs> all those things, and we drove out through Nogales and whatever. Uh, and I made up my mind, I'm never, <laughs> never going to go to Mexico. Um, so, um, why did I get onto that subject? Anyway, um, So, oh, oh yeah, I, the fact that I had worked contract security in a lot of places, uh, a lot of places, and it, when I was working, I was working full-time hospital security, and then working these other jobs for extra money. Uh, now, um, What I wanted to, the point I was trying to make was, because I just thought of it a couple of times, trying to remember it, and now I can't. Now, oh, so I had worked uh, a lot of different places for this contract security. And one of them I worked in Overland Park, Kansas, where that police department was. And I worked. Uh, quite a while at a large, fancy uh, shopping mall there. And the, uh, there was, well, there was two Overland Park police officers that worked there off duty when the mall was open. And then I worked, or, I, or I, one of us security officers worked, and they worked. And uh, they were, very, well, they were kind of nice, except they were nice except they like they wanted me to know like they were in charge. I'm not really sure they were in charge. The, the mall hired them and was paying them a lot of money. You know, I might have been making, well, let's say that I was making $7 an hour. Probably what I was making was for that, for contract security, I was probably making about a dollar more an hour than what the minimum wage was. And they were probably making like $40 an hour because they were off-duty police officers. And uh, at that time, and the, I've seen over the years the price that the police officers got, you know, just, wow. Um, I'm going to put that lid. I'm going to have to warm this up. So anyway, the, oh, anyway then, okay, as an example, you know, I, Kind of off the subject. Cars were being broken into out in the parking lot. You know, the contract company that, you know, the the mall uh, was, you know, paying these two police officers to do, and the two, oh, you know, that was when uh, uh, the movie came out, Jaws. Yeah, the two police officers went in to the movie theater and watched Jaws together. I was patrolling the mall, of course. And uh, they weren't doing much patrolling or anything else, sitting on the security office or whatever, and they weren't doing much. That's a trend I've seen and I've talked about and probably will talk about again. But anyway, cars started being broken into or something out in the parking lot. And the temperature was, it was hot. It was Missouri and it was hot. And uh, now I was going out occasionally, you know, and 
looking around the parking lot and I would go out like one through one door and, and scan the parking lot and go over and look out and I, I kind of I was doing that or whatever anyway the officers or whatever uh, said hey uh, people are breaking in too so you're going to go out and patrol the parking lot and uh, for what I was getting paid I wasn't about to use my car <laughs> and but they had a you know mall pickup truck with no air conditioning uh, no lights on it, but I was, I didn't need lights on it. I wasn't going to be stopping anybody, you know, anyway. So anyway, from then on, that's what they had me doing. And, you know, 100 degree um, humidity, I don't know, 80% or something, you know, uh, over 100 degrees or whatever. And I uh, was out there patrolling the parking lot while they were both inside. They never even came to the door, like to look outside. So, uh, but the police officers that I would encounter, you know, who were driving through the property, I mean, you know, that, who were patrolling, you know, they were really nice. Uh, I saw them stop, you know, the officer on duty, you know, in his nice clean uniforms, of course. Right? A couple of times during that time, I saw the patrol officer stop and help somebody, you know, put a tire on or something like that. And I thought, and then later on, uh, had some occasions to run into like an over, like when I was working at one of the hospitals, hospital security in Kansas City. Uh, ER was busy. Okay, and by the way, this this hospital at this time that I was working there and I worked for them 18 years but I worked uh, 10 of those 18 years nine of them at a hospital in a uh, small town and I happened to live in that small town I could just about see where I lived from the hot that was great nine years but uh, research medical center that that was at at that point, that was, you know, the beginning of the, not assault rifles so much as MAC-10s and all kinds of stuff like that. And we had shootings all the time. Uh, one of the, our patrol cars was shot at. Uh, I got off duty one, when I was working down there at 10 p.m. And I left the parking, the parking lot, drove across the street and uh, two guys on the corner, or whatever, shot at shot at me and hit the car. I was Volkswagen Rabbit, Rabbit, and I heard bang, ping, and I knew right away what that was. I just kept on driving down the road. When I got home, on the guttering, right, you know, uh, there was the dent from the bullet or whatever. Uh, but. Um, Oh, anyway, so it was a bad, <laughs> bad neighborhood. Uh, and an Overland Park police officer, you know, the, the waiting room was filled with a lot of black people, it was a black neighborhood. Uh, and the waiting room was filled and we had a gunshot victim that had come in. And at that time, man, I'm getting really off subject. At that time, how long have I been talking? Oh, only 38 minutes. Wow. <laughs> At that time, when shooting victims would come in, if they weren't dead, you know, the uh, Kansas City, Missouri police officer would, Kansas City, Missouri police officer would show up and come in and walk back and the uh, officer would say, okay. Can't, I'm trying to think of a black name or whatever. That's probably racist, but I'm trying to think of Billy Bob. I don't know what it would be. That be, wouldn't be, that'd be a country name, wouldn't it? Anyway, the police officer would go in and the, and the okay, I'm here about your, about the shooting or whatever. And he would say, uh, fuck you. I'll take care of it myself. I'll take care of myself when I get out of here. And then the officer was like, okay, <laughs> you don't want to make a report. That's right. I don't want to make a report. I'll take care of, my cousin will take care of, you know, my cousin will take care of the report. And uh, then the officer would say, okay, you know, 
223, I'll be HBO, handled by officer, and left. Uh, eventually, by the way, not my oldest child, but later, this is a few years, you know, my uh, oldest daughter that I told you about who had been working for Greenpeace or whatever, she ended up, for a little bit, she worked for a publishing company a very short time in California. And then she got hired in by the Service Employees International Union. Hey, there again, the uh, right wing. Oh my God, they just hated that union uh, because they were trying to organize hospitals and other places, you know, get wages up and stuff like that. And my uh, daughter was a high ranking Immediately, she was a high-ranking officer with the, and she, uh, anyway, uh, so it was not, it was my, uh, it wasn't Hillary. Okay, so it was Ken, <clears throat> my son. Uh, he uh, had a number of jobs. But then he was a dispatcher for the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. So later on when I was, uh, well, I, I noticed, well, I want to get back to, okay, there was an Overland Park police officer there with his wife who was sick, came to the hospital, and they, you know, and he came out and he was, he looked like he was in shock. Well, because the waiting room was full and we had a guy, you know, a black guy that came in and the police off Kansas City showed up, you know, and uh, the guy said, you know, fuck you, I'll take care of it myself. Okay. And he left. Anyway, the Overland Park police officer came out. Of course, he wasn't in uniform, you know. He came out and came over to our district. There, you know, I forget what, I can't remember what it was, but he was like, he'd never seen anything like this. And... They're, they're talking in there about going out and, and, you know, yeah, that happens all the time. And so he got a little bit of an education. Um, but anyway, my uh, son, who was working as a dispatcher, and uh, by the way, this sounds like I'm bragging. I'm not, I'm not really not bragging, but... When, when Ken took the test to become a you know dispatcher or whatever, it was really difficult. And but he got, you know, they were like, even typing. I didn't you know I didn't know he knew how to type, but even typing. Well, we've never had anybody type this fast, you know. And uh, also along the other scores or whatever, you know. Wow, I didn't I really didn't know that. But anyway. Um, And I was talking to him later on, and I was telling, you know, stories, you know. And he said, oh, yeah. He said, you know, when I was dispatcher, you know, it came up from now on because officers are going to hospitals where there's a shooting or something like that. Of course, a lot of the hospitals, they wouldn't have shootings like, like we did. Um, the officers, the dispatchers, we had to give the officer the report number, you know, okay, you know, Meyer and Prospect, uh, you know, uh, gunshot victim in the emergency room, your report number will be, you know, one, two, three, four, five. So you had to write a report on it. Because I knew too that that, that was what was going to happen because uh, sometime, you know, somebody would come in shot really bad. Well, like I was a whole bunch of people this one time flocked into, you know, like the doors open and like 15 people or more come rushing in. And they, unfortunately, the electric doors that we can control and that the nurses control or whatever, the doors, had just let somebody come in or out. And so these people just went right by me, right into the, you know, to the treatment room. And, uh, None of the doctor and none of the nurses were going to go into that treatment room. It wasn't it wasn't very big. I went in there, of course, 
okay, everybody, you, know, you need to get out of here so we can take care of your friend or your relative or you, know, you need to all get out. You know, some of them left. And then I'm with the rest of them, you know, they weren't going to leave, you know. And I said, you know, look, we all got to, you got to get out of here so the staff can take care. There's no room here with you all in here. You got to get out so we can take care of your you know, friend here. And uh, they weren't, you know, they weren't leaving. And so there was an elderly black man there and I turned to him. I said, sir, can you help me? Uh, we want to take care of your, you know, relative or friend or whoever this is. Can you help me get these? And he said, okay, you know, to his people, you know, relatives, or I, get my, I don't know if he's an uncle or a father or grandfather or what. He said, okay, you know, and they all went out. And then the, uh, you know, the nurse and the doctors went in. And then I went out and there was like 15 or 20 people in the waiting room carrying on, you know yelling, jumping up in the air, and all kinds of stuff. And then I said, okay, all of you, you need to go into the waiting room. Everybody go to the waiting room. Everybody go in. Several, half of them maybe went in there. And then I saw, then I had to do like a one-on-one. -on -one. So I go over, you know, <clears throat> you need to go to the waiting room. I've been shot. You've been shot? Yeah, you know. And what it was, you know, the, 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 there was a tavern half a block down on the other side of the street. They had shootings all the time. And what it was, you know, the bullet or bullets, bullet or bullets that were fired, you know, they kicked up uh, marble or concrete or a part of a desk or something, you know, and it injured, so all these people had, you know, minor, you know, this was a minor thing. They could have probably, you know, taken care of it at home. But anyway, so, okay. But, um, oh, I was going to say, you know, uh, why I got on that, I don't know. Uh, anyway, this one time, a young guy in, you know, the, the trauma, trauma room or whatever, and uh, well, they called for me, you know, security, and I went in, I went in there. And the doctor was trying to, he'd been shot. Uh, apparently hit the, order, the artery, the one you don't want to have hit, you know, right above his, in his groin, right above, you know, right above the, 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 his penis. If, so you get to, you know, you get the location or whatever. Little tiny hole, maybe looked like a 25 or, you know, or something. And he's, no, no, I'm going to die. I'm going to, the patient, you know, I'm going to die. And I said, no, you're not going to die. Let the doctor work on you. Let the doctor do what he needs to do, you know, whatever. And uh, I told him again, now you're not going to die. Let the doctor, you know. And uh, then the doctor finally got over there. And then the guy died. And he bled out. And the, I can, uh, I took an EMT course, you know, and graduated after that. I'm not smart, like uh, two of my kids, uh, four kids. So just so you know that I'm not saying my kids, whether, you know, uh, LaDonna, super smart and capable. And the things that I found out that she had, you know, negotiated and whatever. Uh, yeah, let me mention that, you know, she went on to be with the Service Employees International Union. So anyway, I spent uh, at Research Medical Center, I spent there 18 years. Well, I went to other hospitals. For that. I was like their person they sent to other hospitals to uh, work in the small emergency room stuff occasionally. But the, uh, the guy that was like a lieutenant there, he was there before I came to work there. And he was an asshole. And I don't know why he, well, when he wasn't too smart. And, uh, but he had the, which I've seen a couple of times, and I'm sure maybe you have, you know, a large hospital. He, the thing he had going for him was that he had the ability to remember people's faces and names and their spouses' names 
and their kids' names. So as he went through the hospital, oh, Mary, how does it, last time I talked to you, you were, you know, knitting a quilt or whatever. Yeah, okay, you know, and well, how's your son, Bobby? Oh, he's great. He's now in, you know, whatever. He, 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 I can't even remember my own name. And so that was a thing that he had, but he, I think he thought that, that maybe I wanted to be a supervisor. I didn't want to be a supervisor. <laughs> I just wanted to, you know, and I don't know what his problem was, but he had a problem with me and, uh, which I can kind of understand because, uh, people's positions or whatever, you know, I mean, I worked a lot of jobs. You know, 30 years hospital security, but worked other jobs, a whole bunch of other jobs. And not impressed. I mean, I always did my job, always. And no matter what I was paid, even if I was being paid, not really a fair, you know, what I... Well, anyway. So, um, uh, uh, Why did I want to badmouth Charlie? I mean, I had a lot of reasons. Oh, so he did my merit review. Every year you got a merit review. And, you know, the higher the number, but I, and, and a bunch of others too, security officers, there was a limit to how high you could go. Actually, I kind of noticed that the way it worked was I don't think anybody else noticed it, but I happen to notice it. As a security officer, you know, you started in at less than a, uh, say, an RN, less than she would make, of course, you know. And, uh, but what I noticed was that the top salary was what a brand new RN who was coming in and being hired, what she would make, that would be her starting salary. That's just kind of the way that it worked out. I was at the hospital previous to working at Research Medical Center. I actually did end up being, you know, a supervisor. I didn't want to and I resisted, but anyway. And so I had to go through training occasionally through the Human Resources Department. And so I was, there was this one on I forget if it was participatory management or uh, well, what was the other course. Anyway, well, anyway, at that hospital, I was like fire marshal and uh, all kinds of stuff, you know, security officer and all this other kind of stuff. Not that I ever wanted to be. I've told, I think, maybe some of those stories. But at... Uh, uh, at this, so anyway, the guy doing my merit review, Charlie, well, at the other, at the previous hospital that I worked at, and I worked at one previous to that one, at St. Joe Hospital, we had 10 security officers, the nuns did not want to pay money for security, but they had to because there was rioting in Kansas City, Missouri. When I was teaching a little seminar for the Fort Worth PD at the police academy, well, it wasn't in the academy. It was the officers who wanted to be uh, doing some media for, uh, it was over. Anyway, I don't want to make you think I was, but uh, when I was doing the, the little thing for uh, some people who, police officers who wanted to uh, do some good media to get, to tell how great the Fort Worth PD was and, hey, please come to work and that type of stuff. When I was doing that, so I forget what exactly, I think, I think we were doing a practice interview or something like that. And so I had the officer, you know, asking questions or whatever. Uh, and so somehow I got on, somehow I got on to the rioting that, at, at a, the hospital I worked at and the rioting that took place and where they were turning cars over and here's a hospital with very few security officers, not barely able to make it because the nuns didn't want to spend the money. But, uh, and uh, 
so I was talking about that and this young officer and by the way he went on right away I told the the uh, there was two Fort Worth police officers who were it was their project to uh, help you know use YouTube and other media type things to recruit uh, you know officers or whatever that's and so and I was helping out and uh, so this this one one guy police officer very young and gay by the way which that kind of shocked me because uh, it was just at the point where well like for a police department or, for, or a security department or something like that that you're going to have somebody had announced that he was going to not only that uh, during this time that I was helping the Fort Worth PD the uh, guy I was working with really nice there was both the guys I was they were real close to retirement unfortunately I'd like to think that they were still well, I'd like to see them enjoy their but I'd like to you know they were and uh, but anyway so I got taken around well anyway I got taken around to the various I didn't know they had more than one police actually you know of course they do, you know, and one was a big, you know, big building I and mean, multiple, you know, like one floor computers and uh, all kinds of stuff. So I got taken around. It looked like every one of the police officers on the department has a desk, you know, and a computer or whatever. Wow. Uh, but anyway, this one police officer was gay and there on his desk was a picture of his uh Uh, I don't even know, you know, his boyfriend. It was more than that, though. I think, you know, they think they lived together or something. Anyway, and I thought, wow, I can't believe that things have changed that much, you know. And, you know, but anyway, this, this guy was really sharp, the uh, police officer. And then he ended up, you know, in the class that I was doing. And uh, doing it, in, you know, and so then I was telling my stories. <laughs> and, uh, uh, which nobody wants to listen to. Definitely not my ex-wife. Uh, but, so anyway, he then he said, you know, and then I told about, well, when I had a, my, well, my wife and I, at that time, we had a tropical fish shop for four years. And anyway, uh, that's when the rioting happened. And I, anyway, I don't know how, I don't think all this, you know, anyway, I mentioned the rioting and he was like, what rioting? And I said, well, that had been about uh, 19, <laughs> I, th I think I said, I think it'd be about 1972. And he went, oh, wow, you know, it was like, you know, he wasn't born in 1972, you know. But uh, anyway, so this guy, this uh, gay Fort Worth police officer, you know, I went to Catholic schools all my life. I mean, you know, grade school and high school. Uh uh, I don't. I don't think. I don't think we knew what gay was. There was no internet. I didn't know much about sex. I knew nothing about sex. <laughs> we took, we, there was no drinking. You know, not in the. You know, the cat. You know. Uh, but anyway. Uh, anyway, I told these two Fort Worth police officers. I said as we went through this thing of trying to come together, you know, they were working really hard at it. I just helped out a few times and gave, gave some suggestions, you know. Uh, anyway, the chief of police then, he's not the chief of police anymore, but the chief of police then, uh, he told the, you know, well, he didn't personally tell them, but the police officers on the department were told, okay, if you want to make a YouTube video or uh, something on Facebook or whatever you want to do, you can do it at home or you can do it when you're off duty and you will be paid, you know, for 
for doing it. You know, you'll get your wages for, for doing that, if you're, even if you're off duty. And uh, uh, stuff like that. He was very supportive of that. Uh, but anyway, I told these two officers that were in working on the pro that project. One worked in human resources. I think he was. I think he was in charge of human resources. I think, and he had a secretary, and that's what he did. The other officer. I really like both these guys. I, you know, both of them were, both of them had college degrees. Both of them were uh, had been in the United States Marine Corps. And I mean, it just you know, but um, anyway, I told them. I said, you know, uh, well, I told them several things. You know, gave them my advice. They were really nice. So yeah, I mean, not a lot, but I gave them my advice a little bit about like. Uh, at the, he took me to show me the community or the not the, the training, you know, school, and introduced me to a a class of new cadets. I kind of wanted to say something, but I think the, I think the one guy especially, uh, I think he probably uh, I think he maybe intended maybe to let me talk a little bit, but he didn't. <laughs> I mean, he didn't say you know, but because I'm sure he probably knew about my sense of humor or whatever. But um, anyway, I told them, uh, those officers, two officers in charge, I said, you know, this, this really isn't going to work. I'm sorry. I know you want it to work, and you've done excellent. You know, uh, they bought cameras for the police officers that they, you know, didn't give them. But, you know, this is, here's the camera, and if you need some lights, you need a microphone, you know, whatever, so they could do, you know, what they needed to do. Anyway, I said, you know, they're not going to do it. Well, you know, the chief, you know, he, he, he pays them for, you know, for doing it off duty. It's not going to work. I said, I'm sorry. You know, it look, maybe it looks like a lot of fun making a YouTube video or something, but I said, it's work. And I said, they're going to want to go home and have a beer and, you know, watch a sporting event or watch a movie or play video games, you know, on the on the computer or something, they're not going to want to make, you know, a video. They're just not. It's work. It's not, you know, not as easy as it looks. Right away, the gay officer made a video in his car, in his patrol car, uh, saying, you know, the hell that, for, you know, that Fort Worth PD is open to, you know, everybody, blacks and, uh, Blah blah blah. He did it, you know, and he's just sitting in his patrol car, and uh, uh, it did a fantastic job, and which I deserve no credit for. But uh, and he posted almost immediately, and it went like I'm not sure if I'd call it viral, but boom. A whole bunch of you know hits. I mean, a bunch of, of people watching it, and I know it, I I heard that it, the uh, police department uh, police department in Canada, you know, contacted him and said we would like you to come up. You know, we'll pay. I don't know how you know. We'll pay your you know travel. We'll pay for the time. We'll pay such and such, and and you could and please come up and talk to our officers, and stuff like stuff like that. So I went wow. But I didn't see much after. You know, I didn't see much after. There was a few people that, you know, but he just went, wow. So, uh, one minute. That's sort of, so, okay, now I've talked about, what have I talked about? May I tell you? Oh, one thing I wanted to say, maybe I already did, you know. My wife and I, we had four kids. You know, we love them all, of course, like anybody should. Oh, sometimes you see the news and you wonder, you know, wow. But two of our kids were really, you know, smart. And uh, they didn't get it from, you know, they didn't get my, it wasn't my DNAs that done that. And the other two kids, 
they're okay. I mean, you know, but, uh, in the next video, I'm going to talk about my son who at about 20 years of age, he graduated from, you probably, if you're in the United States, you probably heard of the electronic school and he graduated and he was so happy. He was about 20, uh, two year course thing or whatever. And, uh, you know, in order for him to take it. I mean, I, I think that, you know, he took out two school loans and I took out two in, you know, my name. So, I mean, I think the thing was, but anyway, he graduated. And the only company, he wanted to work for Garmin, the, the, like the original company, I think, maybe not. I mean, I know, maybe in some other countries they were doing it first or whatever, but, you know, the things for the cars, the... Uh, tracking and that type of all that type of stuff and he wanted to work for Garmin and it was all set up because he w worked for a, a, a contract you know he was going to school and he's working for a contract electronics thing or something and they sent him to Garmin as a contract employee you know and the deal was uh, after a certain amount of time, you know, the, the contract company doesn't want to send anybody to another company and then have the other company turn around and hire, you know, hire them. So what they usually do is they, there's a thing, you can't work for that, you know, we're sending you to XYZ Corporation, and so you can't go to work for XYZ Corporation uh, until one year after you no longer work for us or something like that. And of course, the company is in it on XYZ Corporation or whatever. And if they <coughs> if they went ahead and hired you or something, then they would have to pay them X amount of money. You know, the contract company. That's that's, that's the way it kind of works like that. But anyway, so my son was all set up to uh, go to work for Garmin, the company he wanted to work for. And then his schizophrenia hit him, bang, all of a sudden. And that's going to be, I guess, this, the uh, topic of my next uh, video. So I thank you for, uh, oh no, something else I wanted. Yeah, I, how did that pop back into my mind? Okay, back to Research Medical Center and getting, a, getting my merit reviews or whatever. Uh, by the way, my, my merit reviews at Research Medical Center Security, average, average at everything. <clears throat> the previous hospital that I worked at, the merit reviews, wow. I, oh, you got one there, it's, you know. Anyway, I hired it, of course, I had worked at St. Joseph Hospital, where we had two officers shot in the line of duty and everything. And uh, I think I told you that story. Uh, the black neighborhood, black hospital administrator, only one in Kansas City. And uh, first security officer shot in the Wabash parking lot. And <clears throat> when the hospital administrator came in, I told this entire story before, but I'm going to keep it short. Uh, I said, uh, when a hospital administrator pulled in, black, uh, out of his car, I said, uh, there's Dan's blood on the parking lot. You need to get bulletproof vests for us. You need to put a, a gate up between that, in between our lot and the church parking lot there because they come through there. And yeah, he just went on. Um, oh, I told him though, I said, if you don't do something, there's going to be another shooting. It probably will not be a security officer. It may be a doctor, a patient, a visitor, no telling who it will be. You need to do something. And he just went on. Uh, so I went over on the second shift, filled in on the, no, 
that was the uh, no, it was the second shift. I went over to the second shift, then filled in for the officer that was shot. Then eventually I went to the midnight shift, and then I came back to the day shift. Came back to the day shift, and uh, John Gallegas, who worked the day shift. Uh, so it's, I don't know what is it a year, or two years later or something. Uh, I worked the day shift, uh, John worked the second shift, he, he came in and I was, I had, the nuns wouldn't buy anything for us, I had bought a shoe shine kit and donated it, you know, to the security department, you know, hey, you guys here, I'll, I'll buy this, you know, the, the uh, stuff and everything and, and uh, so I was waiting for, you know, for the second shift to come in, I was shining my shoes and John Gallegas came in. He was an old timer there. He'd worked there a long time. And he came in and he said, oh my God, he says, you weren't in the military, were you? And I said, nope. He said, I can tell. He says, you don't, he says, how old are you? And I, I forget how old I was, you know. And he said, and you don't know how to shine your shoes. That's pitiful. He says, here. So he shined my shoes for me. And then I talked to him a little bit. You know, I was off the clock then. I talked to him a little bit and then left. A few hours later, they called me and told me that John Gallegas had been shot in the parking lot. He managed to shoot the other guy who shot him. And the uh, shooter came through the church parking lot into our doctor's parking lot. And uh, John was dead when he hit the ground. If he'd been wearing a bulletproof vest, he'd have been okay. Might have had a bruise. Uh, the guy that he shot, they both saw each other at the same time. They both shot at the same time. Uh, the, the other guy, he jumped a fence. <laughs> he must have been in the military or something. Because that was, we didn't have much trouble with that parking lot there. And when I worked at, like, the next hospital I went to one time, the, <clears throat> that's when CB radios were being stolen like crazy. And I just, Making rounds, I go by the director of security's office, and he's in there, God damn lying. And I said, who's lying to you? And he said, oh, he says, you'll know, yeah, you'll know. That director of security over at, you know, St. Joseph Hospital, he says they don't, they're not having any CB radio net stolen, never have. And I said, that's true, they, they haven't. I said, they, you've been over there before. You know, they got a fence that's like 10 foot high with razor all the way around it. I said, We've never had anything, I don't think, stolen out of a car. <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, oh, okay, back to, so at the, I went over to, uh, well, oh, I better go back to that. From St. Joseph Hospital, the hospital administrator comes in and, Kansas City, Missouri police officer, Eugene Sagan, a great police officer. Uh, way, a police, way I wish every police officer across the United States was. Uh, he, he had pulled up there because he, you know, he read in the paper or something, or maybe at the police department, I don't know, you know, that, uh, you know, security officer at St. Joseph Hospital had been shot and killed. So he was there and I went over and uh, he'd always say, get in the car, Jim. No, I'll just stand at the window. You know, that, that was his office. I, the way I felt was that's his office and I don't need to be sitting in his, you know, his office or whatever. But uh, he said, sorry to hear about your friend, John. I said, yeah, you know, and then uh, he said, what are you going to do? I said, what do you mean? He says, I know you, Jim. What are you going to do? And just at that point, the hospital administrator pulled into the parking lot in his uh, fancy car, Lincoln Continental Mark IV or something, you know. So I went over and I said, uh, sir, there's John Gallegas' blood on the parking lot. Now are you going to do something? And he said, no, I don't think I'm going to do anything. Maybe I'll get you guys a horse. 
and then he went into the hospital. I said, I didn't have to do it. It wasn't difficult. That was a doctor's parking lot, by the way. I said, they went. I just went over when uh, Dr. Skinner, or whoever the doctor was, pulled into the parking lot. And I said, doctor, there's John Gallegas' blood. I just talked to the hospital administrator. He says they're not going to do anything. And every one of them went into, they went to administration. Now, some of them said, how much a bulletproof vest? You know, cost. I said, I don't know. I don't think even Kansas City, Missouri police officers had bulletproof vests at that time. Uh, and, you know, doctors would say various things. And they went into, you know, they went into the hospital administrator's office. And about an hour and a half later or something like that, the assistant administrator, the hospital administrator was black, the assistant administrator was white. I had worked a lot of jobs before, I, you know, everybody I think that I worked with, I never told, when I worked places, I didn't say, hey, I used to be a welder. I worked on building a, in uh, Convent, Louisiana, in a Texaco refinery. I, uh, I did such a, you know, I just, I, I talked, I didn't talk about I didn't think they were inter you know. I thought they were interesting stories. But anyway. So, uh, but anyway, I sent these, anyway, I saw the assistant administrator of the hospital, a white guy. Okay, now I'd worked a lot of jobs. I worked, you know, of course, welding, you have your hood down and you really don't know what's going on around you, you know. But I worked for the post office for a while. I, you know, I, uh, uh, my wife and I had a tropical fish shop for four years. Uh, oh, what all did I do? I had, a, I had a ton of jobs. A lot of jobs. Not counting the ones I did part-time. But uh, I didn't know what a suck-ass was or a, uh, whatever, whatever you call somebody who's... And this, this was... It was sickening to me when I... And this was quite a few, you know... I'd never seen that. I mean, if, if when somebody said that, I had no idea. I mean, you know, I mean, I could figure it out that probably, oh, that's some that's somebody who, you know, uh, uh, hangs around the boss and uh, wants to get promoted and wants to appear. But I had this guy with sickening. He was assistant administrator of, you know, he was white. And he came out to his car. I'd never seen, he went, he followed the, unless the hospital administrator wanted to, you know, go do something someplace. Uh, I never, I never seen, I saw them, they were like twins, you know, and his, the assistant was, uh, but anyway, so he act, he comes and acts like he's going to his car, you know, oh, oh, Jim, I didn't, I didn't even know he knew my name, really, you know, <laughs> but he knew it, and Oh, I guess I don't need to go to my car. Oh, oh, by the way, we're going to put a gate across here and we're going to get bulletproof vests for you guys. And then he went back into the hospital. So, of course, I, I decided I'm going to make sure that they do that. And then, of course, I'm going to quit because my name is, there was a, a, a movie, cowboy movie, Pancho Villa or something like that. And, uh, the governor or somebody comes to the town of, or no, I guess a, a delegation goes to Mexico City, I guess, in the movie Pancho Villa, and uh, to give their grievances to, you know, the governor or something about how the, you know, the barons or whatever out there, you know, used, you know, mistreated the, you know, uh, people. And so, and there's a whole bunch of them, you know, and of course, the president of Mexico or whatever is up there, and okay, and he makes his little speech, you know, I'm aware of your, you know, your problems, and you have my, you know, you have my support, I'm behind you, and all this kind of, and of course, the, the people knew, hey, you know, <laughs> no, you know, and then, now does anybody want to say anything, and then just a, a guy, you know, Pancho Villa, you know, and then he, expresses his views and then uh, okay you know the, the governor says okay 
And then, you know, then the the servants, you know, the slaves are going back to their district or whatever. And uh, Pancho Villa takes, uh, you know, the, oh, no, he asked me his name. That's it. Uh, what's your name? Uh, Pancho Villa. Okay. Yeah. Then he take and he takes a circle of the name Pancho Villa. So that's the way I, <laughs> my name was circled, I'm sure. And so I stuck around and I, and the only time we didn't at that hospital, the, the neighborhood, security didn't do jump start, security didn't do snow removal, uh, security didn't leave the property and they, except to go across the street and put gas in the Cushman scooter or something like that. And I'd never left in three and a half years to go run an errand or something, you know. Like at one hospital, they, uh, of course, we had a bunch of security officers. They sent me downtown to the lawyer's office to uh, deliver some papers or pick something up. And I go down and it's like, you know, wow. You know, like you see on TV. Well, now we, we see that stuff, I think, I kind of, but you know. But anyway, uh, they got us bulletproof vest. I didn't put my bulletproof vest on because there was a, a cover for it, you know, but then when that got yucky, you know, whatever, then I guess you'd get a new cover, you know, but I'm not sure the nuns would want to pay for it. I didn't want to, you know, I just left it in the plastic thing. I didn't, I knew I was going, I mean, I was, I knew I was going to quit before they fired me I, because I, uh, I just didn't want to give them the pleasure of thinking, you know, that so I just went over to another hospital, Trinity Lutheran Hospital. Uh, so, oh, I still haven't covered that. Okay. So back at Research Medical Center, the, the guy I told you about who wasn't too smart, but, uh, and... I, th I think he was afraid somebody was going to take his job or do you know do something. Although he had it pretty lined up. I've seen that happen at other places, other hospitals. Some guy who's like one of the original security people. It could be it could be another department like here, and but probably better. <laughs> probably it works better for security, you know. So a new security director comes on, you know. Well, at St. Joe Hospital after a. Uh, when the first security officer was shot, permanently disabled, the nuns fired the uh, director of security. Uh, he was an ex-sergeant with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, and I never saw him drunk, but I figured he's a drinker, you know. And he was there Monday through Friday. He came in the morning, and he left exactly at 3 o'clock or whatever that was, and he went home. But when the security officer was shot, they called him at home to come in, and apparently he'd been drinking, and so he was fired. Uh, so then we didn't have any security director for a while, and then they hired in uh, a guy, and he was an engineer or something for Ford or a Chevrolet or something in Kansas City, Missouri. They were, well, back in those days, they were, you know, major... And he was, and there was a layoff, and he was in the layoff. I guess car sales were down a little bit or something. And uh, uh, so they hired him in, and uh, he had worked, I guess, security at some point in the past in Las Vegas at a casino or something, some type of security at a casino. And so he was hired in, and he put a certificate up on his wall, you know, in the office, you know, six hours of uh, training on something. Not six college credits, but six hours. And then he put another one up there, you know. That was an improvement. I think that was like 12 hours on something. Not 12, con that was it. That was his experience. Well, he'd been a security guard there for a little while. That was it. So uh, by the time he was hired in, because there wasn't any director of security for quite a while, uh, he was on layoff from GM or Ford or something. 
And of course, I knew right away that you know, as soon as they uh, call him back, he's going to go back. He, you know, he's going to go back to being an engineer. Uh, and but uh, John Gallegos was uh, shot almost immediately. Well, okay, John was shot with it on a Friday. Well, anyway, can't remember. Uh, anyway, John Gallegos was shot, and uh, <clears throat> I came in, of course, and uh, uh, the uh, The director of security. I came in, and the director of security said, "You know, there's, there's John's clothes in the bag, you know, plastic bag. The police will be coming by to pick up, you know, pick up that as evidence and everything." And he said, "Okay, uh, don't release it to anybody, and don't release anything to anybody, because uh, he says, did you know that John was, you know, married?" And I said, "No, I didn't." And he said, nobody else knew, apparently. Uh, John and his girlfriend had come over to my, to our house, to my wife and my uh, house, and we'd fixed, you know, dinner for them and visited. And then John invited uh, us later on to uh, his girlfriend's apartment or house, I can't remember. And she was really nice. And... Uh, he, you know, John said, do you like Mexican food? And I said, oh, yeah, I love Taco Bell, you know. No, no, Jim, that's not Mexican. That's not, you, know, you wait. And anyway, then he made, you know, he cooked up the meal. And it was better. I, I, it was better than Taco Bell. I could taste multiple, you know, flavors and everything as I, you know. And so, uh Anyway, nobody knew apparently that well, John was very personal, I mean, very private, not like me. And uh, anyway, okay, back to, so I can end this here. Got almost an hour and a half. Uh, so at Research Medical Center, that, yeah, okay, Research Medical Center, the guy who was like a lieutenant or whatever, uh, well, he had orders, the, the director of security, who had been director of security forever, the worst possible director of security, but he was, he was director of security at uh, General Hospital. You know, he was a Kansas City, Missouri police officer. He got hired in by, uh, uh, what was his name? Pendergast. You can look him up if you want to on Wikipedia or something, rather. He was a, one of the city boss. He was a city boss. He's the guy that took Harry S. Truman under his wing and helped to get Harry, Harry, Harry Truman elected president of the United States. When Harry Truman went to Washington, D.C., the other senators or whatever, uh, that's Pendergast's boy, you know. Whatever. They had no respect, you know. They, didn't have much respect for him. Uh, but anyway, uh, well, anyway, oh yeah, so this guy who was, you know, Pendergast, he would go, he ran the city of Kansas City, Missouri, you know. Okay, Kansas City needs a new city hall. Okay. Uh, my construction company will take care of it. Uh, my concrete company will sell the concrete, my, you know. And then if you wanted a job at Kansas City, you go see a police officer, if you want to be a police officer, a fireman, uh, whatever, you go to him and, okay, you know, now I do you a favor, you remember me, you know. The time may come when I will call upon you to, you know, do me a favor, okay. 
so he signed the card a certain way, or one ink, you know, maybe, you know. And then when the police department got, okay, you're hired, you know. So this guy, uh, Bill Gimmer, you know, he went through the police department system. And from what I've heard, he never, you know, he was like, I don't think he was a patrol officer for very long. Or <laughs> I don't think he'd, I don't think I'd want to be a police, you know, a, you know, and car with no radio and uh, no air conditioning and I mean, you know, so those guys were, those guys were something else. But uh, so he retired from the police department and then he got the job as director of security at General Hospital. That was like the main hospital for the city, you know, that was run by the city or maybe the county was in on it too or something or other. I remember going there as my, uh, Grandmother, she had a total heart block, which is what I have by the way now. Uh, but back then, you, you didn't survive very long. She survived. To uh, she came over and uh, uh, moved in with us, and it was my job to give her the phenobarbital, which I guess is addictive, because she had overdosed a few times on that. So there I was, uh, six years old or something, and. Uh, I was the one who gave her during the daytime her medicine, you know, and I gave her what she was supposed to take and nothing more. And for two years, you know, she uh, read me all the great stories, you know, Treasure Island and uh, Count of Monte Cristo and all that stuff for two years. And, uh, but then several times she had, uh, you know, she went into the hospital, and I couldn't, I was, my mother would take me, my mother would go up, and I'd sit down on a little, like a curb down there, and uh, like one time I was right across in the morgue, and I'd, I'd see a cart come in, and you know, thing hanging down over it, open up a door, and then I'd, oh, yeah, <laughs> move to a different spot, you know. <clears throat> then eventually she uh, passed away, my uh, grandmother, but... Oh, okay. Oh, so this uh, security director, you know, they've been, went through the police department and became a, I don't know what rank, you know, major, I don't know, colonel, I don't know what. Then he went to uh, be in director of security at General Hospital. And by that time I was working as at St. Joseph Hospital where we had two security officers shot. <clears throat> but anyway, there was a <coughs> guy that, <coughs> Um, his he was I didn't know for I didn't know for a while there was a guy that uh, his wife was a frequent patient and so I'd see him you know in the hospital and I'd ask how's your wife doing and everything so I saw him this one day in the emergency room right there and uh, I uh, I said how's your wife doing and he told me and he said he says uh, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. And he said, uh, I forget what he said. Well, he said, I see you guys, and it looks like you do a fantastic job here. And I said, well, thanks. He said, I'm a Kansas City, Missouri a police officer. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. He says, I said, so an extra thank you, you know, for thinking that we're doing a good job. And he says, um, I work over at uh, General Hospital, and I'm up in the unit that they have for uh, people that are, you know, in jail but have to be have to get medical treatment and be admitted or something like that. And he's he said, uh, uh, "Can I ask you a, a question?" I said, "Yeah." He said, "Well, I work in this unit with these guys that are prisoners, you know." And he said. Uh, Two of them jumped me. Two of the prisoners jumped me. And he said, so I was, uh, you know, fighting with these two. And he says there was two security officers there. And he said they did not help me. And he said, I finally got these guys, you know, restrained and everything. And so he says, then I went to the two, to the two security officers. And I said, why didn't you help me? And they said, well, we have strict orders from the director of security, you know. Uh, 
Bill Gilmer, uh, that we're not to help. And uh, if we do help and get involved in any way, you know, we'll be fired. And he, I said, I can't, I said, I can't believe that. He said, you would help. You know, would, and I said, any, any hospital security officer at any hospital would help. I said, I can't believe that those, he says, I went to, he says, a guy was retired Kansas City, Missouri police officer, high ranking, and he was the director of security. He says, I went to them and I said, you know, he said, yeah, that's right. I won't allow them to get involved in, in that. I said, I can't believe it. Anyway, I ended up, uh, he ended up being director of security. By the time I got around, then he was no longer director of security at, he was then director of security at Research Medical Center. And uh, I told you about that. I, I think I think he'd heard about me. And I won't go into that because it's too long. So anyway, this uh, Bill Gilmer, at, uh, while I was working there, he, at there, he worked, he was director of security for about uh, five years because I worked there about five years. Well, I worked there 18 years. But, so uh, he left orders with the lieutenant until a new director who was coming, you know, that I was not to go to Research Belton Hospital where I had put myself on a list years ago that that's where I wanted to go and other officers had put themselves on the list, same list. And I thought, well, they've all got more seniority than, you know, than I do. And uh, so, you know, they'll be going because that's the way, you know, I, I knew it was going to be. And uh, I knew that was the way it's going to be. Anyway, by the time the new hospital was built right out, I could see almost see it from where I lived. And that was a dream come true. Uh, nobody else wanted to go there. Uh, one officer, a very good security officer, and he'd worked there, of course, longer than I had at research. And, and uh, he said, I'm not going to work hospital security by myself. That's what he said from the very beginning. And he said, so they'll have to, and I said, there's not going to be, you know, two security officers there for a hospital that size. I said, they'll have, you know, one security officer, you know, around the clock. Well, it turned out they didn't have one around the clock. <laughs> they just had one at the, on night. One guy who'd put in for it lived right out there, not as close as I did, you know, but to the hospital, but he was a supervisor and a really nice guy. A good, good guy, He's smart and everything else. But he was a supervisor and he said, well, I'm not gonna go out there, you know, and not be as, you know, not be a supervisor. So I was the only one who wanted to go out there. But um, anyway, I ended up going out there for uh, nine years. So anyway, uh, time to get my, you know, my merit review. By that time, I was working as a bike officer down at the, I started out this small hospital I went to. Uh, you know, I, uh, we didn't have a patrol vehicle, of course. And when I came in on Saturday and Sunday, I came in at 6 p.m. And the other nights I came in, the other two nights I came in at uh, 10 p.m. When I came in on, at, uh, you know, 6 p.m., there'd be some, uh, teens out there on their bicycle, usually, a lot of times. And at the front of the hospital, there was water things that, you know, you know, drains, and they were riding those things, having a hell of a time. And so I knew the hospital wouldn't like it because of the liability of, you know, if they fall on the hospital, probably no thing. So I'd step out the front door of the hospital, which was quite a ways away, and they would see me, and then they would leave, you know and whatever. So I brought my bicycle over and just left it at the hospital, you know, ER garage there. And uh, so then weekend came and I saw him down there, you know, so I got on my bike and whoosh, I was right down there with him and I said, hey, you know, 
nice skateboard. It was skateboards, yeah. Nice skateboards. And I talked to him a little bit. And I said, I hate to be, you know, I don't remember exactly what I said a long time ago. I hate to be bearer of bad news, but I said, the hospital does not want you out here, you know, using your skateboards here. They're afraid that you're going to fall or something and hurt yourself and the hospital will be blamed in some way. So I said, you know, please, you know, please don't do it. And, you know, they didn't do that anymore. And occasionally I would take my bicycle and ride around the place where, and rather walk, or rather than walk, I'd usually walk around it, but sometimes I get the bike and just ride around the, uh, the place. And I'd always put on my activity sheet. You had to have an activity sheet. You, everything you did had to go on there. I think actually the reason for that was at all the hospitals was they wanted to see if you did something wrong, you know. But I used it, of course. I'm sure the other guys did too, you know. Hey, I did put on there, so yeah. And it, it saved me a whole bunch of times, you know. Uh, uh, you know, they have a complaint or something, and I'd, I'd say, just look at the activity sheet, you know. There it is. But uh, so anyway, the new director of security, when they opened, well, when he came out. But he already been, he came out once and then came out six months later or something like that. And he said, uh, oh, by the way, he says, don't, don't ride bike patrols. You didn't ask for permission and don't, don't ride bike patrols out here. And I said, okay. I said, I thought it was a good idea, but you know, you, you're the boss, so I won't ride the bike anymore. And then like six months later, I got my merit review. You got a merit review every, every year. And I got the uh, merit review and uh, in there was uh, Jim Howard violated uh, hospital uh, regulations or some or security regulations or something uh, by riding his bicycle and doing patrols in the parking lot at, you know, Research Belton Hospital. And he never asked for permission to do that. And I thought, you know, actually this guy was, a, the old director of security, this guy was much better. Every All the security officers, for as long as he lasted, <laughs> um, always thought that I, uh, you know, hated the guy or something. No, I liked him. He made major improvements to the department. But because I would stand up to, you know, because I would, say, I don't think that's a good idea or something. And I was always right, by the way, although he never admitted I was right, even when it was plainfully obvious, but he was still a nice guy. But anyway, I thought, this is really chicken shit, you know. Uh, he came out and told me not to do it. And now if I'd have ridden my bike after that, then I could say, yeah, write me up, you know, going against what he wanted or something. But, you know, I thought that's kind of chicken shit, you know. But uh, anyway, so uh, I've done my time and I'm getting my merit review from uh, the sergeant or whatever down there who wasn't too smart, but he was an ass kisser and uh, just, you know, not too smart. And I made it plain. I mean, not in the, be not in the beginning. I mean, I had to file a grievance the old director of security, the guy that was the, you know, police officer and then the general hospital and all that. I mean, he was, uh, but so he was officially quit, but I think he may have done like, well, okay, I'm not coming in. Well, I may come in, but for like two weeks for something. So anyway, he told the, guy that was like lieutenant or whatever, who didn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. Uh, Jim Howard is not to go to research Belton Hospital. And uh, so it was shift change time. So we had two shifts, you know, one going home. They kind of had a bunch of, you know, they had a lot of security officers. Well, what was it, 20 more than, I think 25 or more. So they're in the office, and of course, everybody knew that I was the only one who wanted to go to Research Belton Hospital. Uh, there was a story to that, but you know, they, and uh, so anyway, uh, Charlie, oh, Jim, 
by the way, I just want you to know you're not going to be going to research belt in a hospital. And, uh, of course, they'd hired in two guys. And I think one of them had already said to somebody that he was going to be working at research belt in a hospital. So anyway, Charlie said that in front of, every, you know, in front of the, <clears throat> all those security officers. And I said, uh, Charlie, you would not make a pimple on a guard's ass. You are totally incompetent. But do you think you, you could accomplish one small, simple thing for me? I work the midnight shift. I have no access to <clears throat> human resources. I can't go over there and ask for a... Uh, grievance for him. So could you do one simple, simple little thing? Can you get me a grievance for him and have it here, you know, when I come in tonight so I could pick it up? And he said, you know, yeah. When I came in that night, of course, there was no grievance for him, but I got a grievance for him and I filled the grievance for him out. Nobody in the security department, I think, had ever, you know, they had guns, nightsticks, but we didn't have any mace or anything because in a hospital you don't want to be, you know, anyway. But anyway, they, you know, they, and a whole bunch of them, you know, would come into work with a gun magazine or, you know, SWAT magazine or, you know, some, you know, all these. But if the director of security or whatever were to frown or do anything, they would, they'd crap their pants. Well, not all of them. Yeah. But I thought, you know, but anyway. So I did a grievance. Nobody had ever done a grievance, you know. In fact, in that hospital, after that, well, I'd, done, I'd done four grievances at the previous hospital. And at the hospital before that, you know, I, uh, well, the hospital before that, they were, that was the St. Joe Hospital where, you know, the director of security said, or the hospital administrator, maybe I'll get you guys a horse, you know. Uh, they were building a new hospital and uh, out in South Kansas City where there was no blacks. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, uh, when they moved the hospital, like I had a, a security officer there um, at St. Joe Hospital. He said, oh, it's going to be great when we move. I knew I wasn't going to be moving to the new hospital. I had done the thing, you know, made them buy a bulletproof vest and put a gate up. Uh, I knew I, because I was, look, I knew, you know. But anyway, he says, oh, you know, oh, Jim, when we go to the new hospital, they're going to have closed circuit teeth. They're going to have sergeants. They're going to have whatever. And I said, man, yeah. Maybe they'll have, maybe they'll have sergeants and I'm sure they'll have, sure they're going to have closed circuit TV for sure. I said, but uh, you do realize you're not going to be armed. Oh yeah, we're going to be armed. I said, no, you're not. That's, you know, that's a nice safe area. You're not going to be armed. And so then he left. I never went and just talked to the hospital. I did at other places, you know, when I had to, but <laughs> he came back. I just talked to, uh, whatever the guy's name was, Dickinson, can't remember. I just talked to him and he says that, yeah, we're going to be armed out there. And I said, why were you talking to him? And he said, well, he's the director, he's the hospital administrator. And I said, he's black. This is a black neighborhood. He's an asset here out there. He's not an asset. He's the exact opposite. And I said, he won't be going. So I'm um, anyway, I'm not going to take credit for, <laughs> you know, he never went, you know. I saw, I was in a doctor's office uh, years later and I'm flipping through, whoops, there he is. The hospital, that hospital security was out in Chicago or something and he was a vice president, but he was vice president. Of one, they had like 20 vice presidents, maybe 50 and he was one of them, you know. But uh, I didn't take, I don't take credit for him, although I sent every member of the medical staff to his office. And uh, I'm sure every one of them, you know, when it came time, okay, we're moving out in South Kansas City to the new hospital. 
and I'm sure they, I'm sure they said, we don't want, you know, we don't want uh, him going. So, uh, back to what I've been trying to get to. Oh God, almost two hours. Probably none of you are watching anyway, so. I may not do the next, I was going to do another, I may not do that today. Although our son is missing. But maybe he'll be back by then. Um, and we don't know where he is. And uh, anyway. Uh, so anyway, the... Uh, the guy at research was doing my merit review and uh, well he'd already done my merit review yeah yeah that was uh, anyway he was doing my merit review and he said well oh, oh, Jim well I was a bike patrol officer at that time and uh, He says, you're at the top of your pay scale. You've been there for years. And uh, so there'll be no, he says, maybe next year I can, I, you know, uh, uh, he couldn't even get a grievance form for me. And uh, uh, I did four grievances at Trinity, the hospital before. I won all four of them. This hospital, you know, research, I did two grievances. I didn't win, or I, yeah, I did win one going to Research Belton Hospital. Uh, but um, anyway, he says, Well, you're at the top of your pay scale. He says, Maybe next year. I got a God, you know. <laughs> uh, well, like at Trinity, the hospital before that I worked at, I actually. Uh, of course, it was the director of security, you know, allowed me to, wanted me to, and human resources wanted me to do the interviewing for new security officers. And the reason for that was uh, the director of security, I think he said things that, you know, got back to the human resources, things that you don't say. And there was a lieutenant and he definitely uh, messed things up. And so human resources at Jim were glad to hear that you're going to be. And the director of security may have been just doing, having me do it uh, to, maybe I'd stop <laughs> writing him up on grievances or something. I don't know. I mean, maybe he was doing it for experience. But, uh, but and so I did, you know, I, I did that over there. And... Uh, Oh, but anyway, so, you know, Charlie says, well, you're at the top of your pay scale. And, uh, uh, you know, maybe next year you can get, you know, you can get a, a pay increase. And I said, not going to, Charlie, I'm not going to be here next year. I'm uh, retiring. I'm giving you two, two months notice. I decided to give him a lot of notice. <laughs> uh, and, uh, he was some, I mean, it was difficult for him to control his joy and his pleasure that I was quitting, you know. But then he says, well, Jim, what are you going to do? And I said, I thought you would know. I'm going to be organizing a union here at the hospital. And he goes, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh, you know, and, uh, What's funny is, you know, because I, I go on to, uh, you know, go to uh, Orlando for a year, and then I come back to uh, to uh, uh, Texas area here, and and work uh, contract security at the. It was after nine eleven at the you know air traffic control uh, towers. And then I went to Miami and worked hospital or worked yeah hospital security there for no that was the second place or the before that you know which I 
they didn't want, but I, they looked at my, you know, thing down in Orlando, you know, oh my God, I heard him over there, you know, the troop, oh my God, he's got hospital security experience, he's got, you know, 30 years of hospitals, and they came over, and I said, I don't want anything to do with hospitals, please, you got to do it, blah, 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 and I went ahead and, you know, worked it for a while, you know, that was a mistake. Working in-house security was great, basically. You were like part of the team, you know, you and uh, everything, but contract security at a hospital, and especially that hospital, and especially in Florida. So anyway, I, uh, you know, told Charlie I'd be, so anyway, I'm here in tech, in I think Texas or whatever, and my daughter, the, uh, that was working at that time for the Service Employees International Union headquarters in Washington, D.C. I was talking to her and she said, oh, by the way, uh, you know, Dad, uh, I organized the non-nursing employees at uh, a research medical center into a union. Wow. So, you know, I told him, I'm going to be your organ, you know, and I wish he'd have told me. I'd have gone back to Kansas City just to, just to be out there, you know, holding up a placard or whatever, just, you know, but that was, you know, interesting. Also, by the way, when I worked at, you know, Research Belton Hospital, and I worked at, Law, at Lee Summit Hospital, and I worked at uh, whatever, like, you know, I forget the, okay, it was Lee Summit Hospital actually formed a union. For their nurses and another hospital actually but research belton where i worked you know they all we were against unions you know the employees and i you know they said well i said why are you against unions oh uh, the union dues and i said that's not the reason the reason that you're not wanting a union is because you're terrified that you're going to get into trouble or something's going to happen if you do it you don't have any guts it's not the union dues you know but the other two hospitals also that uh, I had nothing to do with that, you know, but I mean, I worked at least some in the hospital. But those nurses, after I, you know, no longer working in security and that type of stuff, they actually formed because, uh, they, oh God, I've gone on too long. Oh, that was what I wanted to tell you. That was, that was wonder. I wish, I wish my daughter had told me that she was going to be organizing there. And I would have gone, and that would have been, that had topped the, you know, that had been so great, me standing out on the sidewalk, handing out, you know, pamphlets, and then after I had said that too, you know. Uh, of course, I don't think he believed me, but the guy who became uh, director of security, and I pretty much... Uh, during the times I was hospital security, I could pretty much uh, know what was going to happen. You know, like, uh, well, God, two minutes. I pretty much could, you know, I could tell what was going to happen. And I was always right. You know, like working at Maine Hospital, they had a meeting of all the employees, or they had them go down to the, you know, go down to the auditorium, and then they'd come and others would go down, and they were handing out things. And it said that all employees, because by that time they owned like 18 hospitals in Kansas City. They went from one hospital to 18 hospitals. In order to keep the for-profit hospitals from coming in, you know, we can't raise your wages much because we've got to keep the for-profit, keep them out. And I told everybody, no. They're getting large. They got all these hospitals. They're going to sell out to the for I named the hospital, you know, for they're, they're going to sell out to them. And oh no no no! They said you know they're not going to. I said no. I said you know we had a psych unit on the seventh floor, right? They knew that of course before I did, you know. And uh, and I said you know we did away with it, but they we let them build a hospital, a mental hospital, on our parking lot and. It's uh, owned by a for-profit corporation in a, in a deal with, you know, research corporate, Health Midwest or whatever. And I said, that's the tip-off, and sure enough, that's what happened, you know. 
they sold all those hospitals. And, uh, okay, I think I better stop two minutes, although there was another thought in my brain, but I don't remember what it was, and I'm going to try not to remember. Anyway, I, I've been talking for two hours, and I want to tell you about the problems with my son because you should be aware of it because if you're in a position, any kind of a position where you can do something, if you're in a police department or a social service department or a hospital, um, and, it, and in anywhere, any way you can help, like with the Fort Worth PD, uh, when I when I was helping them out, I'm not sure I was much help, but uh, at least I got one guy that made one hell of a, a YouTube video. I'm, I don't get no I don't get any credit for that, but I would like to take credit for it because that was amazing. I've made a lot of videos. I haven't had nobody has contacted me from Canada or any place else saying, uh, "Well, would you come over and talk to our people or something like you know something?" You know? So anyway, I would like to take credit for it. I can smart young man and a credit to the Fort Worth Police Department the guy was is last I heard I think he was I'm sure he's probably moved on to something else uh, accident investigation uh, anyway uh, I'll I hope the next when I talk for my next video. I hope by then we know where my where my son is. Oh, anyway, when I talked to the the guys with the, that I was helping with, I said, you know, you need to have a training course in the police academy on how to deal with you know patients with mental illness. And he said, oh, we already have that. And I said, oh, great. I said, I bet you it's not good enough. And then I gave a couple. You know, and he was, you know, he was nice, but I have, you know, I'm sure that he thought that pr their program was good. Well, maybe it is good, but you want it to be excellent, and uh, it isn't. And I, I'll explain a little bit about uh, about the situation. But as of right now. Uh, our son left the other night at uh, 10 p.m. and we had no idea where he went or anything else and then so eventually we called the PD and they were not that they've always been nice they put a thing out for this you know district or whatever uh, and of course the officers some of the officers out here you know have been here and uh, had to deal with, you know, my son. So, uh, but as of right now, our son left here at 10 p.m. the other night. We called the police department at 2 a.m. and the dispatcher said she would put out the information and I guess, the, she didn't say, it, I'm guessing, you know, the Western uh, District. And some of those officers have uh, had to respond on him. And uh, then at 5 a.m., <clears throat> we called, my ex-wife called the uh, hospital and to see if maybe it turned up down there. And he... Uh, he was, but uh, they dismissed him. He has no cell phone. Uh, he has no money. I mean, he has money here, uh, quite a bit, because he never goes anywhere except to the psych hospital. Um, anyway, he turned up at J, you know, at, uh, not JPS, at 
the hospital. JPS, yeah. And they released him at uh, like 4 a.m. Uh, no money. Uh, no anything. But back like a month ago, uh, he ended up at the same hospital and they released him almost right away. So, I mean, he, he needs, he won't take his medication there for a while. For, for several years, he was fine getting a monthly shot of his medication and it worked. So we've had times of peace and tranquility. The ex-wife, of course, very upset that they stopped the monthly injection. And I, uh, she doesn't think I'm very smart, I don't think. And she doesn't listen to me. And uh, but anyway, I tried to explain to her that the medicine, the psychiatric medic medicine, and specifically the one, but all of them or whatever, but especially, they've actually changed his diagnosis from schizophrenia, I think it's now uh, manic depressive, I think. I can't remember. But I tried to explain to her, uh, I tried to explain to her some things and it just doesn't work with her. I tried to explain to her that doctor has to watch these, you know, he wants to see the patients like once a month. Luckily, uh, the doctor's office is half a block, you know, half a block from here. And, uh, you know, the psychiatric clinic or whatever, small one, but um, I tried to explain to her that the medicines that he has taken and was taking, the one, day, especially the shot once a month, right, it worked and we were, we were happy and we were both sorry to hear when they stopped that and wanted to go back to taking pills, which, <laughs> He wouldn't do. Um, you know, when they stopped the uh, shots, uh, myself and my uh, Hillary, you know, we scheduled an appointment with Jimmy to get to see the end of the doctor. And he rode down, a block, half a block, he rode in the car, Hillary's car down there. And then as soon as he got out of the car, he just took off. The clerk or whatever in there, uh, she, you know, we, I went to explain, you know, we tried to get him down here, but he, you know, he won't come, we'll keep trying everything. She actually cried because she knows what, you know, people have to deal with in the situation. She actually cried. That's amazing. Uh, at least I'm in hospital. I worked with a RN in ICU. I'd go over occasionally and sit down, talk a little bit, and she cried several, several times. You know, uh, about various things. So she had, you know, she wasn't cold-hearted or anything like that. Quite to the contrary. Quite the other, you know, the other direction. Anyway, um, I tried to explain to my ex-wife about this injection and them stopping it. I said, I don't know why, except I do know. She says, well, the, uh, the doctor, they were changing doctors down there or something like that, you know? And I said, but he's not when he goes, you know, and they're supposed to be watching things and whatever, because this injection this medication or whatever, it has all types of effects that can be deadly. And so you need a doctor, you know, observing the person or whatever. One of the things, you know, is rapid leg movement, I think. I noticed that when I was working hospital security, you know, at a small hospital, not where I lived or whatever, and I could 
I could there were some other signs and stuff that I could you know I could see and uh, whatever so anyway uh, thank you for very you know thank you for watching I, I'm glad I have the extra high speed right now because <laughs> I have to upload this